the I haven't really woken up oh, until I've had my McDonald's breakfast deal. And I know this is true because before breakfast, I put my phone in the refrigerator and couldn't find the keys that were already in my hand. Nothing gets the morning going like the first sip of an iced coffee. Get any size and any flavor for 99 cents until 11 a.m. Price and participation may vary. McDonald's. I'm loving it. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. Remember, every secret has a price. Lock your doors. Close the blinds. Change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, we are rejoined by author Tim Tate. You may remember him from our episode, Hitler's British Traitors. Today, we're discussing Tim's latest book, The Spy That Was Left Out in the Cold. And it's the extraordinary story of a Polish defector named Mikhail Golineski, who supplied first-rate intelligence and sadly over time after his defection fell from grace. And I've left a link to the book below in the show notes. If you're enjoying this podcast, you can support it in a few ways. First of all, please leave a review on your preferred podcast app. All reviews help us gain more listeners as it raises the awareness of the podcast. I don't know if you know, but all podcast apps are algorithm-based, and the more interaction the show gets, the more listeners it attracts. And just a quick shout out to everybody who's left a review so far. There's been some absolutely wonderful and very kind and in-depth reviews left on iTunes and other podcast apps over the last few months. I've really been blown away by some of them. Some of them have been really super. And thank you so much for taking the time to write those reviews. You can also become a friend of the podcast through Patreon. For £3 a month, you can become a Patreon subscriber and directly support the show. You'll get a free copy of my film, The Dry Cleaner. And on top of that, I will throw in some extras from time to time. One of them in particular will be a behind-the-scenes look at the podcast, and I'm hoping to organise some Zoom drinks soon. If you enjoy this podcast, you may also enjoy my short film, The Dry Cleaner. The Dry Cleaner is my first attempt at original spy fiction, and is now available on Amazon Prime and iTunes. Without further ado, let's get going, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you for listening. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. So, Tim, welcome back to the podcast. Great to see you. Thank you very much for having me again. Wonderful. For the benefit of listeners who may not have heard of our previous episode, please can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm an investigative journalist, uh, the author of 18 non-fiction books, and for more than 30 years Mm -hmm. I was a documentary filmmaker, producing and directing documentaries for all British television networks, as well as international broadcasters. Excellent. Tim, you've got a wonderful new book out called The Spy Who Was Left Out in the Cold. A good title there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of what drew you to the story? And forgive my pronunciation in advance. I'm going to try. Uh, Mikhail Golinevsky. Did I get that right? That's absolutely right. It is quite a tale. Um, I first came across the Golinevsky story, story in the early 1970s. Mm. Um, and at that time, his claims, his his bogus claims, I should say, to be the miraculously surviving son of the last Tsar of Imperial Russia, um, had been publicised in the House of Commons. And the story of why such a successful spy, and whatever else Mikhail Golyanevsky might have been, he was a devastatingly successful spy. The story of why such a successful spy should then claim both falsely to be the Tsarevich, who, as history had recorded, had been assassinated in 1918, that intrigued me. But there was very little good information around at the time. And so over the decade, years and decades, I gradually assembled bits of documents, bits of information here, bits of information there. It wasn't really until 2016, 2017, when the first portions of the official files 
and that's primarily the CIA's files, became available, that actually discovering what had happened became viable. Mm. And how did you navigate some of that misinformation that surrounds this case? Because there's quite a lot of sort of conflicting accounts. There's an enormous amount of misinformation mm. and in some cases disinformation. Um, I like to work from primary source documents, you know, so original documents, copies of original documents. Prizing those out of the various government agencies proved to be not as easy as you might hope it would be. Eventually, after I'd nagged at them for a while, the CIA, under the Freedom of Information Act, did release um, a number of pages from his file, but refused to release the rest. MI5, which confirmed to me in writing that it does still hold a file on Golianevsky, refused point blank to release it. It said, even though this is more than 60 years old, Golianevsky defected literally 60 years ago this year. MI5 says that the, uh, in its words, the continuing sensitivity of the material means that it doesn't want to release it. I mean, that's strange, to put it mildly. But I suppose neither the CIA nor MI5 is that efficient at preventing its documents from leaching out into other files. So I spent a couple of years trawling through related files mm. and lo and behold, reports about Golianevsky and reports of what Golianevsky had done and had said and given both services were contained in there. So that was a pretty good start. The big, for me, the big win, if you like, was getting hold of Golianevsky's Polish intelligence service files. He was a Polish intelligence service officer and his entire Polish intelligence service file, which is 1100 pages, largely unredacted, was available. Now that was, that was revelatory and it painted in many cases a slightly different, rather different picture to that which we had become accustomed to here in the West. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Can you talk to us a little bit about the um, what was the intelligence situation regarding Russia like for Western intelligence and particularly the CIA prior to Golanesky's approach? In short, disastrous. Um, so this is not my yeah. assessment. It's the CIA's own assessment. As part of the research, I got hold of internal CIA reports into its history and its abilities during the Cold War. These have been declassified and released mm, mm. under FOI. And they show that throughout the 1950s, from the moment of its inception onwards, the CIA was struggling to get any reliable intelligence out of the Soviet Union and satellite countries. And the result was, again, in its estimation, a, an, a disastrous series of failures, mm. both of covert ops in which people were caught and killed, and in failures of intelligence. And the reports make pretty, or made at the time, and make now pretty dismal reading. What they highlighted then, and is relevant now, was the need for what we now call human, human intelligence. They needed either agents in place behind the Iron Curtain or defectors. And they had little in the way of either. So when Golyanevsky arrives on the scene, approaches US intelligence voluntarily and out of the blue in April 1958, in theory, he was exactly what Western intelligence needed. 
Yeah. And can you talk to us talk to us about the information he was offering and how he became an asset for Western intelligence and also the initial dilemma his contact created? Mikhail Kolyanevsky was a career Polish intelligence service officer. He and by nineteen fifty eight he was a very, very senior officer indeed mm. in Polish intelligence and counterintelligence and he was simultaneously working for the KGB essentially I suppose as its point person in uh, in Warsaw combining liaison between the KGB and the Polish intelligence with a little bit of spying on his own colleagues and passing that back to Moscow so he's a very big fish indeed in Soviet bloc intelligence. In April 1958 he decides he is going to approach Western intelligence and offer his services and offer information about Polish and K Polish intelligence and KGB operations mm. worldwide. Mm. He does so by sending a letter, smuggling essentially, a letter to the US ambassador in Bern in Switzerland. And he says, I have lots of information I'm prepared to give to the West, but there are two things. Firstly, he doesn't give his name. He only gives himself a code name. And that code name was in German, because he wrote in German, Heckenschutz, or which translates as sniper. And the second and main condition of his offer was that he would only, repeat, only deal with the FBI. And the reason he said was that every other branch of the US government and US intelligence had been penetrated to his knowledge by Soviet bloc intelligence. The letter arrives at the US ambassador's office in Bern. It's very plainly unexpected and it's, it is distinctly unusual. You know, walk-ins were rare in those days and unsolicited offers of intelligence were just, just never happened. Um, protocol, American protocol, demanded that Anyone like Sniper, Heckenschutz, offering intelligence couldn't be dealt with by the FBI because that foreign intelligence was the purview, the bailiwick, exclusively of the CIA. So without telling Sniper, his material is rooted not to the FBI, but to the CIA, which he had warned he wouldn't deal with because it was penetrated. And for the next three years, the CIA keeps up this deception. It encourages him to send more and more material. And he does send material just about every month. Hundreds upon hundreds of pages of top secret Soviet bloc intelligence documents. Hundreds of individual minox microfilm frames and these detail not just kgb and polish intelligence operations throughout europe and in the united states but the names and cover names of the spies he's exposing hundreds of his own spies and doing so believing he's dealing securely with the FBI. Yeah, so this is an amazing opportunity for the CIA and Western intelligence. Oh, it's it's unprecedented. Mm. And one of the documents I prized out of the CIA, with some reluctance on their part, I think, was an assessment of just how important he was. And they wrote this, I think, probably in around 1964, 1965. And they, t they counted up the number of Soviet bloc spies he'd exposed to them. Mm. Mm. 1,693. No one before or since has ever 
ever provided that level of detail and that amount of intelligence. It was the richest of rich halls. Yeah, yeah, no, fantastic. Can you talk to us a bit about this sort of a spy craft question, I suppose? Can you talk to us a bit about sort of the how he provided the information from behind the Iron Curtain and also about how the sort of CIA sort of were judging this information? How he was providing it is is a sort of classic bit of Cold War espionage armor, if you like. His first letter in which he offered this intelligence, offered to supply intelligence, he said, if you want to pursue this, you, the FBI director, because that's who you thought he was talking to, have you should put an advert in the classified columns of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, <laughs> daily newspaper in Frankfurt, mm. a coded message in the personal columns. And that way I'll know that you want to deal with me. And that's exactly what happened. The CIA posing as the FBI placed the advert and provided him over the coming months with the locations of a series of dead drops, places where he could take material, deposit it safely. One was in the in the Gents Loo in the uh, zoo station, Zoo Bahnhof in West Berlin. What One of the things that told the CIA was that whoever this mysterious benefactor was, this mysterious agent in place, he had access to West Berlin. So he was traveling. He was plainly in possession of KGB and Polish intelligence secrets, but he also was able to travel to Berlin and to the West to leave these films and documents in dead drops, which were then shuttled back to Washington. Yeah. So actually, one quick thing. So obviously the CIA didn't know who he was at this point, did they? The CIA had absolutely no idea who this man was. The best they could do was some forensic analysis on the mm. letters he sent, uh, looking at the typeface and analysing the paper and also analysing the language. And from that, they worked out that he was almost certainly Polish, probably worked in Polish intelligence and had access to the KGB, top levels of the KGB. But beyond that, they knew absolutely nothing beyond the fact of his cover name, the one he'd chosen for himself, Heckenschutz or Sniper. Mm. So the CIA couldn't move on the information they had uh, about Russian spies in Israel, Britain, Germany and the US for fear of exposing Sniper. Can you? So the information still kept rolling in, and um, and they were getting a better mix. They were getting a better mixture of sort of Soviet and Polish documents, but the CIA was now sort of internally divided about the reliability of Sniper. Can you talk to us a bit about how uh, a bit about this and how Sniper kind of came to know his information was being used? Because I'm assuming he must he must have felt motivated to keep going. Yeah, I mean there is very plainly a back and forth between. Mm what he assumed was the F FBI is in fact the CIA and Sniper in Warsaw. Only one of his reports has escaped the CIA's censorship and it's a lengthy document sent in 1960 and it's absolutely chock full of material. It's chock full of names, dates, places. Mm -hmm. The but which is coming <laughs> is that from the very beginning Although half of the CIA, crudely, thought this man is the best thing since sliced bread, mm. the head of the counterintelligence staff, the eminence grise, if you like, of the CIA, James Jesus Angleton, was incredibly suspicious mm. and didn't believe that this was a genuine offer of intelligence. In fairness, his job as head of counterintelligence required him to take a sceptical view of gift horses bearing Soviet material, Soviet bloc material. And he suspected that Sniper, whoever Sniper was, was either a provocation or a dangle in, in spy jargon. You know, someone sending false leads to 
lead the CIA down false trails or a dangle at a completely bogus individual who didn't even possibly exist. And so his antagonism and scepticism coloured the way that Sniper was dealt with, even at the time when he, Sniper, was risking his life as an agent in place undercover inside Polish intelligence in the KGB. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about James Jesus Angleton? Because he's such a fascinating character, and obviously he had first-hand experience of being um, effectively deceived. Angleton, is, as you say, is absolutely a fascinating character. I mean, it's, it's always difficult when you get someone as big and, uh, and, frankly, monstrous as Angleton not to let him take over the narrative when you're yeah. writing a book. <laughs> Angleton was a wartime OSS officer, the pre... OSS, the pre predecessor of the CIA. Um, and he had studied and learnt his trade, if you like, at the knees of British intelligence, which was then, during World War II, the dominant force in Western intelligence. He had studied, he had learnt about and been inculcated into the double cross system, Masterman's double cross system, and had absorbed Masterman's dictum that essentially the greater the value of what you're being offered as a spy master or a spy runner, the more likely it is that you're being conned. You know, so when you start from that premise, it can be quite difficult yeah. to take yeah. a reasoned assessment. Angleton was a bizarre character. I mean, he he had never he didn't speak Russian, which is a bit odd since he was became essentially the man who ran the CIA's Soviet counterintelligence programs. Mm, mm, mm. He was professionally paranoid. He was a heavy drinker. He was ridiculously secretive, even in a trade which rightly values secrecy. Angleton took it to such extremes. He created a group of apostles around him and he would feed out little bits of information to one or two of them, but no one ever knew the full picture of anything. He was he was essentially the controlling force within the CIA for well over a decade, probably closer to two decades, and exercised in the end and in the final analysis, again, not my analysis, but the CIA's own analysis, a, 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 a malign influence which destroyed, destroyed lives, destroyed careers, but also destroyed the CIA's ability to operate properly. Yeah, yeah. He lost all perspective, effectively. Yeah, I mean, he, he claims to have coined the phrase the wilderness of mirrors, which is the classic <laughs> phrase to describe counterintelligence. Whether or not he did coin that phrase, it's undoubtedly true that he, he himself got lost in that wilderness of mirrors. So he couldn't tell whether what he was seeing was reality or a reflection, a distorted reflection in the mirrored glass. Yeah, no, definitely an interesting figure of history to learn from. So with all this sense of information Sniper was sharing, it was putting him at greater risk of being exposed. Yet US intelligence were increasing the risks to him with poor information sharing practices. And they were partly caused by departmental feuds, and in particular with the State Department, when they were warned about security issues at the embassy in Warsaw. Can you talk to us a little bit about all this and those departmental feuds in particular? Sniper, in his lengthy monthly letters full of information, warned that the US embassy in Poland had been deeply penetrated by the KGB and by Polish intelligence. He said there was a very senior foreign service officer, very senior diplomat, who was and had been a KGB undercover agent for many years. And he warned that even, even low-level embassy staff and guards were being entrapped, caught in honey traps. And he talked about a, a, what we now call a Red Swallows programme, attractive Polish young women who lure embassy staff into sexual relationships before the 
Polish security services burst in, photograph them, mm. blackmail them, and then they've got some more spies. So Snipers wa- warned about this and gives extremely detailed information about this. He thinks, again, I have to repeat, he thinks he's passing this to the FBI. He isn't. It's going to the CIA. The CIA has a problem now. It's not just keeping this from the FBI, but embassy staff and for the Foreign Service is the purview of the State Department. So it knows, the CIA knows, it has to share this with the State Department. So off Sniper's material goes, anonymously, because the CIA don't know who he is, to the State Department. Once it starts escaping from the secure bubble which Sniper believed he was working within, trouble is brewing from day one. And so it proved. The information leaks. The information leaks back from Polish intelligence and KGB moles within the State Department, the very Mm. ones that Sniper has warned about. Mm. It leaks back to Polish intelligence and the KGB, and they discover that they have a mole. What happens then is just bizarre. Because the KGB says, well, we've got a mole who's f- feeding this information to the US. Who do we, and he's, he's in Warsaw, who are we going to get to investigate this, to stop this leak? I know, we'll use our point man in Warsaw, Mikhail Golianewski. So they, they ask Golianewski to investigate the person who is leaking to the Americans, who is Golianewski? Mm. <laughs> Be like Kim Philby's situation almost, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it, it's the first of many almost farcical elements mm. in this. But there's, beyond the farce, there's something very serious. Golinevsky alerts the US. He, he sends them a letter saying, look, this has happened. They now know that someone is leaking and they've got me looking for myself. But I will keep trying to, to keep this going just please be careful from now mm, on, because if mm. you don't, I'm going to end up up against a wall and getting a bullet. And he's absolutely explicit in that warning. It doesn't make any difference. The material keeps leaking. And at that point, Golianevsky's on very, very borrowed time in Warsaw. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of the many factors that leads to his ultimate defection. So can you talk to us a bit about his defection and how he was received by the CIA? Because this is quite this is quite an interesting story, this one. <laughs> his defection, and you know, the account of his defection comes from the CIA's own log of the day, which eventually I prized out of Langley. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> So it's, you know, this is from the horse's mouth, if you like. And it's one of those stories which it's just like a 1950s spy movie. So Sniper Golianevsky, on Christmas Day 1960, goes on the run. He's been warned by his masters in Warsaw that time's running out. He's been told... That's it. You're going to be moved at best. And he knows he's got to get out. So he grabs a bundle of cash from office funds in Warsaw, a whole wad of more secret documents, and hightails it over to East Berlin, where he has a mistress. And he tells his mistress, who's a young school secretary called Ermgard Kampf, we're going to defect. Now, she doesn't, like everybody else, she doesn't know his real name. And that will cause problems in the, the days to come. But he spends the days between Christmas and the uh, New Year, this is Koyanevsky, dodging tales. This, the Stasi have put a... Uh, have put a tail on him and are watching his every move. He also thinks he's being watched by Polish intelligence. So he's ducking and diving throughout East and West Berlin, trying to get more cash from the Polish embassy in Warsaw, trying to recover more documents he stashed, and trying to 
keep his mistress on side while he prepares the ground to defect. He's been given a defector hotline number by the US and he rings it and says, I'm coming in, I'm coming in on January the 4th, be ready to receive me. The CIA, CIA goes onto high alert. They fly in people from Washington and they have the staff at the US consulate in West Berlin readied not just to receive him, but to protect him if the KGB or Polish intelligence or the Stasi make an attempt to kidnap him as he approaches the embassy compound. Mm. So they've got armed guards out. They've got armoured cars out. It's This is a full court press. He gets the embassy safe and sound, and they're surprised to find that he's got a woman in tow. They knew nothing about this. But he says, she's my wife. Okay, we didn't know you had a wife, but come on in, yes, we'll give you both asylum. Mm. But you have to tell us who you are. Bear in mind, they didn't know who he was. And at this point, it's like the theatre of, of the absurd has started. He says, I will tell you exactly who I am, but my wife must wait outside the room while I talk to you. Well, that's a bit odd. They agree to that. And he said, she has to wait outside because she's not my wife. She's my mistress. She doesn't know my real name. She doesn't know my job. She doesn't really know what we're doing. And I don't know whether you're going to trust her and give her asylum as well. They reassure him. This goes on for several hours. And they say, but you've got to tell us who you are. OK, I'll tell you who I am. And he then starts to give them one of several cover names. They spend quite some time exploring that cover identity before he says, oh, no, that's not my real name. So there's another deep sigh, right? <laughs> What's your real name? And that's when he tells them the first mm. time in three years, my name is Lieutenant Colonel Michal Golianewski. I'm an officer of the Polish Intelligence Service. And here is my official card, my official identity documents. And at that point, the CIA is jubilant. It knows that it, this man is sniper. It knows that he's for real. And it knows that he's ready and willing to give yet more secrets. And this, the agency's own log of the day describes how joyous the agency's officers felt, we've got him, snipers for real, he's come in, we're in business. If they had only been able to look just a few weeks ahead, I think they would have been a little less happy. <laughs> well, can you talk to us a little bit about those sort of weeks ahead and how he was treated and uh, and how he sort of treated the CIA as he uh, as he was sort of processed, if we put it that way? <laughs> they had initially planned to fly him straight out of West Berlin that night. But by the time all this farcical stuff with mistress, wife, not mistress, not wife, wrong identity is sorted out, it's far too late. So they all right, we'll put you on a plane tomorrow morning early and they flew him and um, God Kampf to the defector reception center at Wiesbaden at first light essentially the next morning. Normally they would have expected Golinevsky, a defector like Golinevsky, to be at the center mm. for 24-48 hours. Just enough time to establish basic bona fides. No. Golinevsky is a very different defector to anything they've ever known. From the moment they got him there and sat him down and started to debrief him, it just came flooding out, hour upon hour, day upon day. So much information, so much detail. I mean, the, the, the CIA's documents describe the man as having almost a photographic memory and an, an extraordinary ability to recall detail and he just keeps divulging more to the point he wants to control all the proceedings the cia has a manual for dealing with defectors which says 
you get them there they're dependent on you you're the top dog interrogator make sure they know this Golianovsky wasn't having any of that it, this was his show and he was going to tell the CIA what to do and he did and so the 24 hours which had initially been planned to keep him there dragged on for a week more and more debriefings and at some point within that the CIA faced a dilemma all this time Golianovsky thinks he's dealing with the FBI they've continued to con him finally they have to say all right we'll come clean we're not the FBI we're the CIA and that's that's a devastating moment for Golianovsky he knows the CIA is so badly penetrated that it can't be trusted but at the same time he's stuck you know he's he's there he's dependent on the agency not just for food and lodging but for his very life and for that of his mistress girlfriend call her what you will at that point um god camp and he has this choice to make do i i can't go back do i refuse to talk in which case they will send me back and if i go back i'll get a bullet in the back of the neck or do i talk and risk it and he has no choice and he says okay in the end i will i will deal with you but he's I mean, his own writings show that he was deeply unhappy and felt he had been betrayed and that's at the start of the relationship between the cia and Golianeski. Yeah, it's not a great start <laughs> no i mean it's it's a mm. very inauspicious mm. start mm. so how reliable was the information he provided can you give us a can you give us a sort of overview perspective on the information he provided um, and how it stands up historically i think the best way of doing that is to look at the major spying cases mm. which were exposed and solved in the West purely, purely because of Golianovsky's information. Yeah. You know, if we start with Britain, he gave information about what we now know, now call the Portland spy ring. This was a sort of lowish level admiralty naval employee who with his mistress was leaking secrets admiralty secrets naval secrets to the kgb and had been doing so for about 10 years mm. golianevsky exposed him mi5 was able to identify this man and his accomplice beyond that they found his handler who was a big, big fish, a big KGB fish. And only as a result of Golianevsky's information was the Portland spy ring of Harry Houghton, Bunty G, the handler, Conan Melody, and two other KGB illegals working under false names. Mm -hmm. Own th those five people were exposed. That huge spy ring was exposed only because of Golianevsky. That was only the beginning. After that, in Britain, there was also George Blake. Now, Blake is a major, major figure in British espionage. He's a quite senior officer in MI6. Has been for a while. But for more than a decade, he's been a double agent. He's working for the KGB. Again, Golianevsky's information is what proves crucial in identifying him and in causing Blake to break down and admit it and the leak to be stopped. And Blake, in fact, was jailed. That's just in the UK. Beyond that, there was the deputy head of the West German intelligence service who had been a, a KGB double agent for at least a decade. Golianevsky's information led to him and his accomplices being caught. The, a very senior NATO officer and Swedish Air Force officer simultaneously who had been leaking Western secrets, 
more Western secrets than it's comfortable to think about. Mm. For at least a decade, Golinevsky's information led to his exposure. The same in Israel, a very senior figure in, Isra in the Israeli military apparatus and a close confidant of the Prime Minister, Ben Gurion. Golinevsky exposed him. These are case after case after case, major cases which Golinevsky exposed. These are just the ones, the big ones, which we know about because they were publicized to a degree or some degree anyway. Beyond that, there are hundreds upon hundreds of other agents, undercover spies, sleepers, whom Golinevsky exposed. Mm. So we can agree, in a sense, he was a pretty sound source in the end. Well, I mean, don't take my word for it. Take the CIA's word for it um, and, and MI5's word for it. You know, yeah. what I found was ringing endorsements by both the CIA and MI5 written endorsements, which say this this guy was essentially the best spy the West ever had. Yeah. Golianevsky's taken to the States in 1961. The CIA gives him a contract. It gives him a nice safe house in Arlington, Virginia, or an apartment. It gives him money to furnish it. It even sponsors his wedding to Ermgard Kampf it, under an entirely fictitious name, which should have precluded it. But the CIA steps in and says to the to the court and to the county, no, no, it's fine. We'll mm. vouch for him. Mm. So at that point, everything's set fair. And for the next two years, two to three years, he keeps giving more and more and more information every bit of it as valuable as the last. I mean, it is, in the words of one of his handlers, it was a rich bounty of leads and information. Mm. Um, mm. The internal papers, the internal agency papers and MI5 papers show that this was just, this was like Christmas had come and kept coming. Mm. Everything should have been fine. But then it went wrong. So the first thing is obviously the um, the Russian and Polish government were both quite upset about his defection. And the Polish government started a sort of secret trial. Can you talk to us a bit about that and what came of that? The trial itself was in April 1961. So just three mm. months after Golyanevsky defected. And, you know, I think a lot of us, we used, aren't we now, to the, to the image of show trials, Soviet era show trials in which a cowed and often brutalized defendant is dragged into the dock and makes a tearful confession of his crimes. This trial wasn't like that at all. For a start, Golyanevsky wasn't there, so he mm. was tried in absentia. But it was held in secret. There was no attempt at any form of show trial. It was a military court. It considered two charges against Golyanevsky. First, stealing quite substantial sums of foreign currency from Polish intelligence, but the really serious charge was betrayal of the homeland, treason, mm. in mm. other words. And because it was held behind closed doors, and because no one knew it was happening, the court heard evidence which was extraordinarily, extraordinarily frank from Golyanevsky's superiors in the Polish intelligence service. I, I found this, I found these transcripts in his file, his Polish intelligence file, and they are absolutely crystal clear about the damage he caused. It was, it was devastating to the Polish intelligence service and also to the KGB. I mean, it set Soviet bloc intelligence back years. Unsurprisingly, at the end of the day, at that day's trial, the court found him guilty and sentenced him to death, which was really the only, only sentence he had available. It couldn't carry that out because he didn't know where he was, but it would spend the next nearly 10 years looking for him and trying to catch him and trying to carry out that sentence. Yeah. One question, actually. How 
common was it for Russia or Soviet backed kind of intelligence services to actually kind of hunt down and kill defectors? Common's a difficult word. I don't know, <laughs> you know how yeah. how frequently did it happen? I don't I don't think anyone knows. Absolutely it happened. Mm. The KGB had then and like its successor, the FSB today, a well developed program and technique of assassinating those it considered traitors. Again, not my word for this. At the time, just just before Golianevsky defected, the US Congress took testimony from another Soviet KGB defector who gave chapter and verse about how it did this using using poison. Um, you know, sixty years sixty years on it, or sixty yeah. years later, it's, it's yeah. the same technique as with Litvin- Litvinenko. Yeah. Um, so yes, the KGB and its satellite services did carry out assassinations. It they did target and kill those who had defected and caused devastation to their services. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk to us about Angleton's desire to discredit Golineski and the monster plot, which did terrible damage to those sort of outside of Angleton's sort of counterintelligence circle or fiefdom, maybe we should call it. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Just under a year after Golineski defected, while he's sitting in his safe house, br- giving endless debriefings, more and more detail, another Soviet bloc intelligence officer defects. And this man, Anatoly Golitsyn, mm. arrived defected, bearing virtually no intelligence. I mean, the internal CIA review ass- assessment of his case and what followed is absolutely crystal clear that he he had only a few came with only a handful of very unimportant KGB documents and absolutely no viable KGB secrets. Nonetheless, when he arrived, he was taken up by Angleton and he told Angleton and the CIA, I am the only true defector. Anyone who came before me and anyone who comes after me is bogus. What that meant for Golianevsky was that if Angleton believed it, Golianevsky was, as Angleton had long wanted to believe, a fake defector. Golitsyn did an incalculable damage, not just to the CIA, but also to MI5, to, to all of Western intelligence. When he arrives, he's adopted by Angleton. Angleton buys into his thesis on the basis of no good evidence. And over the next two or three years, gives Galitzin the run of Western intelligence files. That has a knock-on effect on Golinevsky. He finds himself being frozen out, his leads being slow-walked, coming under suspicion. It also leads to what the CIA termed the master plan. This is this Mm. theory that Galitzin and Angleton came up with, that everything other than Galitzin was a grand Soviet deception. It was so devastating and so damaging to every part of the CIA that officers who didn't believe in it within Langley termed it the monster plot. And that's exactly how it turned out. It would claim dozens of careers. It would lead to Golianevsky being frozen out and to the CIA gradually destabilizing his already slightly tenuous mental state. Mm. And it would lead to the paralysis of Western intelligence for a decade. So the internal divisions in the CIA were giving very mixed signals to Golianevsky. What impact did all of this and Angleton's kind of, should we put it, witch hunt have on him? Like most defectors, Golianevsky was a difficult character. I, mean, I, I mm. don't think you become a defector without being a difficult character. That's what the record shows. He's different to most defectors in that he's a defector 
or first an agent in place and then a defector, from principle. Mm. He did this because he genuinely wanted to counter Soviet communism from within the system. Most defectors who've arrived or had arrived by that point did so because they were in trouble with their masters in, in Moscow or for a better life in the West, not out of principle. But he's a difficult character. He is entirely dependent on the CIA for absolutely everything. Money, housing, food, safety. Safety is a big one. And he, as an intelligence agent and as a defector, is prone to paranoia as well as arrogance. As Angleton and Galitzin's malign axis takes hold and squeezes Kolinevsky out and begins to lead to harassment of him, and there's no other word for it but harassment, mm. his mental threads begin to fray. He begins, what begins as, from his own writings, puzzlement and anger at the way he's mm. being treated mm. slowly spirals into a growing paranoia in which he begins to lose his grip on reality at the same time as one at one side of the cia is harassing him giving him a hard time slow walking his leads the other side of the cia is sponsoring a bill a private bill in congress to give him, Golinevsky, the right to citizenship. This would enable him to bypass immigration rules and apply to become a US citizen, which he couldn't otherwise have done because he had been a Soviet bloc intelligence officer. So for a start, there's mixed signals there, isn't there? One side's doing this, the other side's doing that. What had been a constant, even when this bill slowly winds its way through Congress, is that no one knew, no one outside the CIA or a few selected parts of the FBI and the State Department and Congress, no one knew about Kolinevsky. His existence, never mind his location, was secret. And that was for the very good reason that they needed to keep him safe. All that gets blown in the spring of 1964 when one of the biggest New York daily papers, the New York Journal American, starts publishing revelations about Golyanevsky's existence. It names him, it says roughly where he's living, and it's doing this on the basis of leaks from one of the congressional aides who has been handling the citizenship bill. At that point, everything begins to fall apart from Golinevsky, for Golinevsky. For a start, the CIA accuse him of leaking it. Now, whatever else he's done at that point, he absolutely hadn't leaked it. He, with his loosening grip on reality, decides that the CIA has done it and has put the New York Journal American and the reporter Guy Richards up to this, that it's part of a conspiracy against him. And suddenly these subpoenas start arriving from, from the Senate saying, we want you to come and give evidence. He, is, he finds himself under pressure from all sides and he's, he's feeling trapped and squeezed and very, very vulnerable. This coincides with two things. Firstly, his wife has got to, has to go into hospital, have a breast tumour removed, and she's pregnant, their first child. And secondly, the CIA suddenly cuts him off. It reneges on its contract, stops paying him, stops protecting him, tries to impound the gun it's arranged for him to have for his own protection and steps up the harassment of him. 
It has been messing with his mind by this point for about a year. And his mind was fracturing yeah. very plainly at this point. And at that point, he flips out completely. Mm. Mm. And this is what leads to, well, potentially leads to him claiming he's the surviving son of the Tsar of Russia. Um, and he accuses Langley of trying to deprive him of a, a rightful inheritance. Can you talk to us about this sort of bizarre extra twist on the tale? Yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's a twist you couldn't, you know, if you were writing fiction, you couldn't make this up, could you? <laughs> um, it's not actually, it actually, his... Romanov fantasy begins slightly earlier than the main CIA campaign against him. And I don't think at the point it starts that it's Golinevsky having gone mad. I think it's greed. I think it's mm. greed, pure and simple. Because there's a lot of money, isn't there, he could make? Well, he discovers that an Anastasia claimant mm. has surfaced in New York. And he gets in touch with the publisher who's handling this and says he wants to give information. Essentially, what he's trying to do is to get this Anastasia claimant to support him as a as a the Tsarevich claimant in return for him supporting her claims to be Anastasia. And when you look at the transcripts of what he said at the time, around that time, it's very plain that he's got his sights on something very valuable in his mind indeed. There were stories, there had been rumours for decades that the last Tsar, prior to the revolution, had squirrelled a fortune out of Russia into the West to banks in the US and France and Britain, and that this alleged fortune was, by the time Golyanevsky starts claiming to to be the Tsarevich worth between 200 and 400 million dollars and he makes plain he wants it so I think it's greed he sees I've got a chance to get my hands on this money you know it's easy for us in 2021 to look back and think really someone was taken in by this you know Golinevsky's 40 42, 43, at something like that at this point, the real Zarabich would have been 60-something. They look rather different in age. How did this, how did they get taken in? We have to remember, at that point, the bodies of the Romanov family hadn't been discovered. Mm. And that Romanov fever was beginning to bubble worldwide. You know, it would culminate in the movie Nicholas and Alexandra and there was this bogus in my view glamour associated with the the, the imperial Russian throne so Golyanevsky starts claiming to be the Tsarevich from what the paperwork his own documents show to be a motive of greed he wants to get his hands on this alleged fortune but once he started down that road, it's very difficult to get off. And he makes it worse. By that point, just to make things even more complex, he's living under two different cover names in New York, both of which have been given to him by the CIA, and one of which mm. is what his alien registration card says. Mm. Mm. He then decides to get married again to, to his wife, existing wife, in a Russian Orthodox church ceremony officiated by the, the most senior bishop, if you like, pres proto-presbyter of the Russian Orthodox church outside Russia, and he does so in the name of Alexei Romanov. And this gets recorded in the Paris registers. I've got hold of the Paris registers, I've got hold of the marriage license. So he's now calling himself Alexei Romanov, and his daughter, who is born literally hours after this second entirely bigamous wedding, I should say, is christened as Tatiana Romanov. He's now trapped himself in this Romanov fantasy. 
and there's no getting out of it. Yeah. Book your New Jersey summer getaway now. Go for sunshine vibes and beach and boardwalk fun. Discover parks, forests, and family attractions, distinctive dining, and inspiring art, history, and culture. Stay in an urban oasis, an Oceanside Inn, or other unique accommodations. Boost your mood in New Jersey's feel-great destinations. Create your escape at visitnj.org slash book now. So by the autumn of 1965, the CIA had sort of lost all patience with him and they unilaterally ended his employment status and abandoned all responsibility for him. So how did he react and what did it mean for him to be without any CIA support? Well, he didn't react well, as you might expect. Um, He tries to sue the CIA, but Mm. that gets nowhere. Golianevsky was an imperious character. He, fa- he falls out with abs- almost everybody with whom he comes into contact and who supports him, initially supports him. He then begins publishing a series of, you know, I think you can only call them Jeremiads, these la- vast screeds of largely incomprehensible word salads denouncing the CIA, denouncing Western intelligence, denouncing the way he's been treated. And he publishes them as paid adverts in the New York Times and the Washington Post. And and he also begins writing letters to the CIA, to Congress, to the FBI, and to a succession of presidents, demanding that they do something about it. Almost all of this gets ignored and is treated as viewed by the CIA as more evidence that the man's gone insane. But he's in trouble financially. They've cut him off financially. He's got a wife. He's got a small child. He has no health insurance. He has no security now. He's living in a flat in New York, what may or may not be a CIA protected apartment block in New York. And he's deeply worried about money, he's deeply worried about security, and he's right to be worried about both. It's it's that odd thing. You know, we, we like stories to be black and white, don't we? You know, they're the baddies, he's a goodie, he's a baddie, they're the goodies. The problem with the Golianevsky saga all the way through is that everyone is both good and bad at, at the same time, or you know, largely simultaneously. So the CIA behaved appallingly, but then there were reasons for it to behave appallingly. Not always correct reasons, but there were understandable reasons. Golianevsky behaved appallingly, but then he had behaved brilliantly and risked his life and still tried to behave brilliantly. It's, it's, you know, there's, it's not, a, it's not so much as not being black and white. It's, a thousand different shades of grey and trying to sift who did what to whom when and why was quite some task well well done for navigating all of that so Golanovsky's former employers obviously the UB were looking to kill him uh, but they also had these sort of plans to discredit him as well can you talk to us a bit about their efforts and how sort of successful they were in some of those efforts when I got hold of the Polish intelligence files and had them translated, what was, I mean, it was gobsmacking to see what they had done. Mm. They launched what they called Operation Teletechnic. Mm. That was both the code name for the operation and for Golinevsky himself. And it had essentially a twin pronged approach. The first was to try and find him. They didn't know where he was. So they spent an enormous amount of time and effort and foreign currency trying to track him down and they would it would take them a good seven years from the moment he defected before they were able to do that and there was only one one reason to track him down they wanted to carry out the death sentence that the court had imposed simultaneously though they said well we're going to have a second track to this investigation and that's to discredit Golianevsky and to use his own somewhat checkered past against him as a way of discrediting not just his information and intelligence, but the CIA, which took him in and nurtured him. 
And this scheme was Byzantine. It was extraordinary. So they tapped assets. They sent undercover agents into the States, trying to track him down, trying to get, get hold of his associates. And they also decided they would target his mother back in Warsaw. And there's this lengthy and really tawdry undercover operation in which they try and try and get her to betray his whereabouts and to play on her weaknesses to do this. I mean, it, it really is fairly grubby. And that culminated with Polish intelligence putting together this utterly bizarre scheme whereby Golyanevsky's mother would be married bogusly, mm. would go through a bogus marriage to an American who had been an agent or someone found by Polish intelligence. And that would enable them, she would then go to the States and that would enable them to find Golyanevsky because he would contact her. It's this labyrinthine plot and it lasted a decade. It was extraordinary. And reading through these these files and seeing quite what they'd got up to and the lengths they had gone to was extraordinary. Yeah, I bet. So Angleton's sort of spy or mole hunt didn't just affect the CIA. It also affected MI5 as well. And by 1969, they kind of reached their, you know, they were definitely sort of at their peak. Can you talk to us a bit about all this? Golyanevsky warned the CIA that it was penetrated as well as the State Department and the US government and 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 he gave very clear leads as to where to find those people yeah he also warned MI5 that it had been penetrated and he gave a very clear lead to what he called a middle ranking agent middle ranking officer I'm sorry within MI5 those leads should have been pursued. Golinovsky's track record alone made him a reliable source of information. And we know that because MI5's documents and the CIA's documents say exactly that. But they weren't. Those leads weren't pursued. And the reason they weren't pursued is because Angleton and Galitzin come up with an entirely different theory about penetration and who was doing penetration and how it was being done. Their mole hunts, the mole hunts that Angleton and Galitzin caused in the CIA and in MI5, tore both of those services apart for a decade. Again, that isn't my phrase, that isn't my judgment. This is MI5's judgment and this is the CIA's judgment. And they were looking for the mythical moles that Galitzin claimed to mm. know, identify mm. and thus overlooking the very real moles that Gal Golyanevsky had given leads to. It was madness. It, it just was madness. Mm. And in Britain, this is what led to the book Spycatcher, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, there's a long and convoluted trail to get there, but one of the first MI5 officers to work on the sniper Golyanevsky case was Peter Wright. And he was brought in to start work on the Portland spying information mm. in 1959, mm. when Golyanevsky's intelligence first came across. And he worked and worked and worked on this information and other information that Golyanevsky provided for a decade or more and initially he was after accepting everything that Golyanevsky had done and saying what a great job he'd done he then became an acolyte of Galitzin only to realize a few years later that Galitzin had led him and Angleton and MI5 and everybody else down the garden path. And then he went back, did Peter Wright, to Golyanevsky's information. And he started looking at this and he, he describes how he had this terrible moment that he realised that 
MI5 had been played and that they had missed this and they had missed something so serious and he starts digging and digging and digging. Uh, by the time he gets to this point and he's going through all of this, MI5's had enough. It's been torn apart for a decade and it says, oh, oh do shut up, bugger off. And that leads eventually, it's one of the things which leads right to say, I'm going to write my book, Spy Catcher. And the rest is a very messy history. Well, it is, yes. Yeah. So Roger Hollis, the former head of MI5, is accused of being a, a Soviet mole. And uh, and that, Matt, continues on that accusation today. I like feel like Chapman Pinch, who passed away a few years back on his, you know, one of his last articles was about Sir Roger Hollis being the fifth man or something. And Yeah, in, I mean, we should say in fairness that Golianevsky was asked about that. Yeah. And he said no. He said, you know, if Hollis or someone at that level had been mm. a Soviet mole, then am I, am, all the cases that I gave to MI5 in which they broke, mm. the Portland Spiring, mm. Blake and the rest, that wouldn't have happened because he, someone at that senior would have stopped them. So Golianevsky says, no, it's Galitzin who says, oh, yeah, Roger Hollis. Oh, and by the way, Harold Wilson as well. And it goes on and on and mm. on. Yeah, which obviously creates a lot of uh, uh, disruption within the uh, the services and stops them from actually doing a good job, doesn't it? Well, I mean, again, if MI5's own official history says, yes, it stopped, stopped things in its tracks. The internal CIA documents, its analyses, which were kept secret for decades, mm. are, are, are even more plain. They say, basically, these mole hunts paralysed us and paralysed Western intelligence for a decade. You know, and the irony in all of this, one of the ironies, is that all the intelligence advantage which Golianevsky had risked his life to mm. give the West mm. was squandered. Yeah. So what ultimately becomes of Golianevsky? And this is where it becomes, I think the story becomes quite tragic. Yeah. Um, for the next, from the late mid to late sixties through the seventies, he becomes an ever more isolated figure. He's picked up and championed by some of the nastiest right wing anti communist groups, like the John Birch Society and their acolytes in the states, who use Golianeski to push their own agenda, and he goes along with that for the simple reason that they give him a platform. He carries on publishing these Jeremiads. He writes and swears lengthy affidavits, which are lodged in the New York City Register Office. It took me a year to find these, but my God, when I found them, they were, they were important. Um, he gradually goes quite genuinely insane. He's become trapped in this Romanov fantasy. He sees conspiracy theories everywhere. When someone initially supports him, they're fine, they're great, they're the best things in sliced bread. When they see through him, they become added as villains in this pantomime conspiracy. And there's, there's a good example of that. Where we started was where I came into the Golanevsky story when it's raised in the House of Commons. Mm. And it's raised by a liberal, then Liberal MP called Peter Bessel, who was sort of Jeremy Thorpe's right hand man. Bessel initially, and I found correspondence between him and Golanevsky in, in an academic archive in the US, accepts Golanevsky and champions him and says, your Highness, and you're the, you're the Tsarevich. Golianovsky then takes a document that Bessel has provided him, uses it to forge another document, and Bessel, who is no shrinking violet when it comes to dishonesty himself, says, whoa, this man is beyond the pale, and sends him a stinging letter saying, you've got to stop this, and you've got to come clean, and you're not Alexei Romanov. 
please stop this. It's a measure of Gogonevsky's utter loss of sanity that Bessel thereafter becomes not just added to the pantheon of villains, but he he accuses Bessel of being a long dead Soviet NKVD secret police chief, a man who died in the 1940s. But no, no, Peter Bessel is this person. And there's a whole succession of people like that. Guy Richards, who initially championed Goganevsky's case in the New York Journal American, when he sees through Goganevsky and when they fall out, Goganevsky attacks him publicly and in print as being Reinhard Heydrich somehow. You know, the, yeah. the Nazi, the, <laughs> one of the most senior SS figures mm. who was assassinated. All of this is evidence of Goganevsky's growing insanity. And he publishes a lot of this as well as in right wing news sheets, anti communist news sheets. But he then starts publishing his own. It's called Double Eagle. And it is, it's incredibly sad. This was a, a man with a brilliant mind and a very brave man who has completely lost his grip on sanity. You know, for, you get, I, I managed to track down several ish, editions of this. And it's just very sad to read. So that's what he does for the next 20, 30 years. He sits in his, in his apartment on, uh, on Long Island and he churns out these Jeremiads. He tries to get attention. Whether the CIA has, has decided to keep paying him money is a bit mm. unclear. Mm. But he's certainly surviving on something, though there are constant appeals for money. And it's all this really sad, shabby, down-at-heel life. Even his death is odd. There are no official documents reporting his death. There is no grave. There is no death certificate that I can find. There is nothing. The best we've got are a couple of anecdotal accounts of him dying in Lennox Hospital in New York City in 1993. But try as I might, and believe me I did, I couldn't track down any documentary evidence of where, how or when he died. Mm. Wow. Is there anything else you would like to add about this uh, before we sort of wrap up? Are there any like final thoughts or is there a lesson in all this that we could learn? Two things that struck me, one in the two or three years that it, I've devoted of my life to, yeah. to doing yeah. this. The first is that a lot of what Golianewski warned about hasn't changed. You know, the, the disinformation campaigns that he warned were Moscow's speciality for what he described in the 1950s and early 1960s, that's exactly what's been happening with the KGB's success at the FSB in the 2016 election, even mm. the Brexit referendum and the 2020 election in the US. That hasn't changed. You know, we haven't learned those lessons. The other thing which, and it's a frequent hobby horse, I suspect, of mine, I find it uncomfortable to put it mildly that Golianevsky's Polish intelligence file is available it's 1100 pages it's almost all unredacted it's there he was notionally at least a traitor to Polish intelligence in the US and in Britain his files and bear in mind he was a hero if you mm. like, to Britain mm. and the US, his files are not available. I was able to prize some portions out of the CIA and find fragments in other files. But when I approached MI5 and said, look, it's 60 years since this man defected and three decades since the Soviet Union collapsed, 
have you got a file on Kolyanevsky still and will you release it? After some nagging, it came back to me and it said, yes, we do have a file. We do still have a file on Golianevsky, but we won't release it. Now, I, I think it's disgraceful that the files of a communist intelligence service on a man who risked his life to help the West are more accessible and more available than those of the Western intelligence services who were the grateful recipients of his intelligence and then who caused him trouble. Yeah. And is there any real good reason why they should sit on those files today? I think that depends on who you ask, really, doesn't mm. it? Um, <laughs> as a researcher and a journalist and a writer, I would say no. I cannot see any logical excuse for this. The Soviet Union's gone. It's dead. You know, all, Kolyanevsky's defection was 60 years ago. What can be so sensitive, and that's what MI5 says, what, what is the continuing sensitivity? There may be a clue in Kolyanevsky's own writings. Mm. He talks about how the middle-ranking agent whom he identified in MI5 was never found and never pursued. Mm. Mm. Is that why MI5 won't discuss it? He talks about, and there are contemporary letters from him, in which he's furious that his information about Philby wasn't acted on before Philby was allowed to escape. Is that why MI5 is keeping it secret? I don't know. And MI5 doesn't answer questions like that. I just don't see any excuse for being so closed mouthed yeah well tim thank you very much for all of that where can listeners sort of find out more about you and your work and your excellent book thank you for that um they can go to my website which is www.timtate.co.uk there are details of all my books there and indeed there's also several of my films are available to view on that um and the book is or will be available in all good bookshops and on amazon of course Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. Bud Light Seltzer has the loudest flavors ever. Introducing the new Bud Light Seltzer Hard Soda Variety Pack. Hard Seltzer with a pop of soda. Get all the satisfying sweetness of soda pop with a refreshment of hard seltzer. All with zero sugar. Bud Light Seltzer is making some serious noise with the debut of its newest Super Bowl commercial by welcoming fans to the land of loud flavors. A magical universe that brings the bold and unexpected taste of Bud Light Seltzer and its most recent and loudest innovation, Bud Light Seltzer Hard Soda, to life. All with the help of the king of flavor himself, celebrity chef Guy Fieri. Nostalgic flavors like classic cola, cherry cola, Orange soda and citrus soda offer the satisfying sweetness of soda pop with a refreshment of hard seltzer. Zero sugar, 5% ABV, 100 calories, gluten-free, naturally flavored. Head over to BudLight.com to learn more. Bud Light Seltzer, the loudest flavors ever. Enjoy responsibly. Messaging for 21 plus.